In a previous lesson, we explored how to define a reaction rate in terms of the slopes of the concentrations of any of the reactants or products. What this means is that if we know the rate of one species, we can determine the rate of any other. What it doesn't tell us is the rate of that first species. That's what we're going to look at now. Let's look at some general reactions where A and B react to form C and D. And there are some stoichiometric coefficients in front of each reactant and product. We have defined the rate of this reaction in terms of the derivatives of concentrations, but we would like to know the rate in terms of the concentrations themselves, some function, that is, of the concentrations. In many cases, this function experimentally is of this form, a constant called the rate coefficient, multiplied by the reactants, products, and sometimes other species, each raised to some power. These powers are often integers, although occasionally they can be fractions. They are called the reaction order in their corresponding species, and the sum of the reaction orders is the overall order of the reaction. You cannot just look at the balanced chemical equation for a reaction to determine this function. You have to run some experiments to find it. So this equation is known as the empirical rate law. Not all rate laws have this form. For example, here's an empirical rate law where there are not well-defined reaction orders, but there are enough cases where this form is valid that it is a useful starting point for talking about rate laws. The most common rate laws have some positive reaction order for some or all of their reactants, meaning that the reaction happens faster when the concentrations of the reactants are higher. This should make intuitive sense, because the more reactants you have, the more frequently they will bump into each other, causing the reaction to occur. Sometimes products can appear in the rate law. If their reaction orders are positive, then the reaction speeds up as the products are formed, in a process known as autocatalysis, which can sometimes lead to explosive behavior, literally. If the reaction orders of the products are negative, then the reaction slows down based on the presence of the product. In this case, either the product acts as an inhibitor to the reaction, or there is a reverse reaction in equilibrium with the forward reaction. Sometimes species that are neither reactants nor products can appear in the rate law. If their reaction order is positive, then this species speeds up the reaction and is called a catalyst. If their reaction order is negative, then this species slows down the reaction and is called an inhibitor or an anti-catalyst. For the moment, we are going to focus on rate laws where just the reactants play a role, although the extension of the methods we are going to discuss to products and catalysts should seem relatively straightforward. Assuming that the rate law is of this form, determining the rate law comes down to finding the reaction orders and the rate coefficient. Let's look at one particularly effective way to do this experimentally, known as the method of initial rates. And for this discussion, let's look at a specific reaction rather than the generic one we've been looking at up till now. In this case, we have the, a method of measuring the rate of formation of the ClO3- ions. So we will use that one for our rate definition. And we will assume that the empirical rate law is of the standard form. So our problem reduces to determining A, B, and K. Here are the experiments we are going to run. We have initial concentrations of the two reactants. In the second experiment, we double the initial concentration of ClO2. In the third experiment, we double the concentration of hydroxide. Then we are going to monitor the concentration of ClO3- as a function of time. When we do that, here are the results we get. As you can see, in each case, the concentration of the product starts at zero and then grows over time. But experiment two is faster than experiment one, and experiment three is faster than experiment two. We now look at the very early time, the initial in the phrase initial rates, and find the slopes. These are the initial rates we will be using for our analysis. And we add those slopes to our table. Let's take our expression for the initial rate. Here all I have done is add subscripted zeros to indicate that these are the rate and the concentrations at time zero. Now I'm going to indicate which experiment number the equation is referring to. Make sure you understand this notation before you move on. Pause the video if necessary. Now here's the clever part. We're going to take a pair of experiments where one of the concentrations was the same and divide the two rate expressions. It's a lot easier if you put the experiment with the higher concentrations in the numerator. Notice what cancels. 
the rate coefficients, and the hydroxide ion concentrations, because we carefully chose to keep the hydroxide concentration the same in these two experiments. Now we plug in our numbers. Normally I would be a stickler about including units on these intermediate steps, but since the units are identical in the numerator and the denominator, they will cancel, and so we can ignore them, and combine the two concentrations on the right since they are raised to the same power. The right side becomes 2 to the power of A, and the left side becomes 4. And just by inspection, we can tell that A equals 2. We add that 2 to our growing rate equation on the left and go through the process again. Notice how between experiments 2 and 3, we kept the ClO2 concentration constant. So we divide the third experiment by the second, cancel, noting that it is a different species that cancels, plug in the numbers, do the division, and find B. So now we know this reaction is second order in ClO2 and first order in hydroxide. We can now plug in any of the experiments into the equation to find the value for the rate coefficient, and we get the same answer regardless of which one we choose. And there we have it. Three experiments that let us find the empirical rate law for a reaction. Three carefully chosen experiments and some clever ratioing is all it took.